Hello and welcome to this broadcast by Brexit Watch. I'm your host, Jonathan Saxby. Today we are delighted to welcome the Canadian politician and candidate to be the next leader of the Canadian Conservative Party, Erin O'Toole. A decorated captain in the Royal Canadian Air Force, Mr O'Toole has served as Minister of Veterans Affairs, as well as the official opposition critic for foreign affairs. Mr O'Toole, welcome to Brexit Watch. Good to join you, Jonathan. Now, before we get into the meat of our discussion, um, I'd like to take this opportunity to wish you and your family well during this unprecedented crisis. Can I begin by asking how the coronavirus crisis has personally impacted you and your work over the last few months? Well, thank you, and I hope you and uh, your family and friends are well uh, in this crisis as well. Uh, like everyone, there's been a fundamental shift with how we do our job. So I'm a member of parliament in the Toronto area. Um, there's 338 members of parliament in our, our parliament, and I'm from the most populated area, the Toronto area. There's not many conservatives there, sadly, but I will change that. Um, so my office there in the constituency has been closed and Prime Minister Trudeau has literally tried to avoid as much scrutiny as possible. So our parliament has only very uh, infrequently uh, sat. We've had some ridiculous virtual sittings. Um, it's been quite disappointing. So I have been in the House of Commons in Ottawa on a few occasions and I asked a few few questions and was involved in some of the emergency uh, legislation that was passed. Uh, but my, my work has been primarily in the first few weeks helping my constituents, many of whom were stuck overseas. I had some stuck on cruise ships that couldn't pull into ports and, and one, uh, one caught the, the coronavirus. And now we're transitioning to trying to help uh, businesses, farms, a lot of people that are, are profoundly impacted by the economic part of this crisis. Uh, and I'm running for leader of the Conservative Party, mainly <laughs> through the screens of our members like this, through Zoom calls, through sort of teletown halls, these sorts of things. So uh, I think I'm slowly driving my family crazy because I'm <laughs> broadcasting from a, a room in our house. But uh, I'm, I'm very fortunate our family's healthy and uh, many of the people in my constituency are doing better now. And I'm just worried about the long-term economic damage of the crisis. Now, Erin, sticking with the crisis, um, can you give, give us a, a, your take on how the government in Canada has handled the crisis compared to governments elsewhere in the Western world? And what's the situation like right now on the ground in Canada? Well, thank you. Um, the Trudeau government has handled the crisis very poorly. In fact, uh, I think Canada was too late to respond to the health impact. We could have, we could have seen uh, levels in Canada closer to Australia and New Zealand on a per capita basis had our government taken prudent action earlier, uh, as the Conservative opposition was calling for, as I was calling for. And I think here is where Mr. Trudeau's um, UN Security Council seat bid had him unwilling to even question some of the slow advice coming from the World Health Organization. Uh, he was contradicting himself uh, throughout March on whether we should stop, close the border, whether masks should be used. There was really a confused response to the health crisis. The government was late and we have more community spread cases in Canada than we than we should have had we taken travel restrictions seriously from the start. The economic response has also been very, very slow and confused. The, the Trudeau government has not even paid a cent out in rent assistance for business yet, uh, has only recently paid a little uh, of the wage subsidy amount. And this is months later. So what happened is we have far more unemployment than, than we should have. Had we put a number of the jobs into hibernation for a few months through a number of wage subsidy measures, uh, we would have preserved jobs for the recovery. Now we have around 8 million Canadians drawing an emergency benefit called the CERB in Canada and fewer jobs to return to. So the, the slow and confused state of the Trudeau response, at first he was 
proposing to only spend $27 billion in new financial aid as he was winding down the entire economy. Now we're at the uh, closing in on 300 billion. So to compare those two, you could mm -hmm. suggest he didn't know what he was doing. And uh, it's been frustrating to watch, particularly as he's uh, as he has suppressed Parliament from sitting. So there's he does a daily press conference. M my colleague Andrew Shearer, the interim leader of the Conservative Party, has said Mr. Trudeau prefers an audience, not an opposition. And that's so true. He's been trying to dominate media discussion and have very little scrutiny of their efforts. Um, on the country now, we seem to have flattened the curve in most of the provinces. Uh, Quebec and Ontario were hit the worst, so the Toronto area and the Montreal area in particular. Um, we are anticipating continued cases and a second wave, so we're trying to really make sure that our economic reopening takes the best practices in terms of social distancing in the workplace, use of masks in some of the close service type industries. Uh, I think our economy and our, our, our society will have to adjust for the next couple of years to make sure we can open up, but mitigate the risks. And I think there's been no federal leadership in Canada. So our provinces uh, have been really taking the lead. So the premiers of each of the provinces have been much more hands-on than the Trudeau government. Mm. Now we'll talk a little bit more about the consequences of the of the crisis, both for Canada and also globally. It's a global issue, and obviously, uh, all Western countries, well, virtually every country in the world, has uh, has been hit. No one has been unscathed. You mentioned, Erin, the World Health Organization. Um, President Trump, uh, in your southern neighbour, uh, has obviously had uh, had some issues with the World Health Organization. Where do you stand on that issue? Do you think President Trump is, is right in calling out the World Health Organization? Well, I think in the middle of a pandemic, you should never remove the budget from a department responding to the pandemic. So that was uh, an inappropriate measure. But the underlying concerns about the WHO, Jonathan, I've been, vo I've been voicing for three to four years now. In fact, it's ironic, but two years ago in the House of Commons, I asked Justin Trudeau about the Communist Party of China's manipulation of the WHO in terms of excluding Taiwan from pandemic planning. And Taiwan in particular, Taiwan and Canada were very much involved in the SARS crisis uh, almost two decades ago, where there was an outbreak uh, in, of course, China, Hong Kong and the, and the periphery, but also Toronto was a major outbreak uh, spot. So the WHO as an agency meant to bring all players together to take the politics out for the purposes of public health. Beijing was asserting its political agenda within the WHO and they were complying. Same thing happens with other agencies of the UN, ICAO, the Civil Aviation Organization, um, also bowing to pressure from, from Beijing. And that's frustrating because that agency is headquartered in Montreal. It's headquartered in Canada. So I think I've been calling for many years for U United Nations reform. Um, the, the free countries, the democracies of the world have to start bringing um, that agency and the body into account. You don't do it in the middle of the pandemic. But I certainly think if you look at the, the timeline, the Communist Party in China suppressed information on the initial outbreak. The WHO worked with China and were either captured by them or we're, we're willfully blind to the early response China was bringing. So the WHO, as the lead on pandemic, was probably at least a month to a month and a half late in declaring uh, uh, a public health pandemic and, and risks. And there has to be accountability for that. Now, you've spoken a fair bit about China there, Erin. I mean, um, a lot of people in the in the Western world feel that China needs to be in some way held to account uh, for what has happened. What are your thoughts on that? And what are your thoughts more broadly about the future relationship between China and the Western world? Are we due for a reset? Yes, we are. And we've been due for many years. And I really think the COVID-19 global pandemic and economic catastrophe that's resulted from it 
is the tipping point. Um, a think tank in Canada called it Beijing's Chernobyl moment uh, in terms of not being able to um, ensure that the world doesn't notice that the some of the bad actions of the Communist Party in China has impacted not only their neighbors, but in many cases, the world. Um, I've, been, I've been calling for this for a few years. In fact, our parliament in December, we have a hung parliament or a minority parliament in Canada. And the first defeat of the Trudeau Liberals in this minority parliament was my motion on establishing a new parliamentary oversight committee of Canada-China relations. It's obviously been dwarfed now by the pandemic, mm -hmm. but in my speech last December, I talked about all elements, including uh, influence at the WHO and UN agencies, South China Sea Islands, human rights concerns from the Uyghurs to the situation in Hong Kong, which even in the last week has further descended into uh, um, you know, blatant disregard for the one country's two systems agreement, uh, blatant disregard for the democratic and, and the rights of Hong Kongers. Um, China has ambitions in the Arctic, a whole range of things. And then still, it's a, China's in space, yet still considers itself a developing country. So they have kind of gamed many of the world's systems from the World Trade Organization through to the UN. Uh, there's very serious concerns about, about human rights and national security in terms of uh, cyber warfare and a range of other things. So it is time that uh, the, the Western world, but really I've said the Five Eyes group of nations mm -hmm. should start providing a counterbalance to the actions of China. And I think Canada has a very special role to play because usually we've been the one that can help bridge three of the allies and the United States, because the United States is our, our neighbor, our, our friend, um, but it, we're also a domestic homeland security partner with the United States through NORAD. So Churchill called Canada the linchpin between uh, the UK and, and Europe and the United States. Uh, we need to play that role again. And then the five eyes can really, really start reforming the rules-based international system to not allow bad actors to game it. It's interesting you mentioned Five Eyes, and obviously that touches on the whole issue of Kanzak, which we'll come to a bit later on. But before we do, let's just stay with the uh, coronavirus crisis. Spoken about some of the geopolitical implications, you spoke earlier about the economic implications. What do you think some of the economic implications will be, both for Canada and more globally of the crisis? What do you see those as being? I think the biggest realignment or result from, from the COVID-19 global pandemic will be trade rebalancing. Uh, I really do think that um, some of the concerns that many of us have had um, um, have not been acted upon in unison by countries to, to really make sure that um, supply routes and supply chains and um, countries that are more aligned to the values of, of the democratic world are, are preferred over bad actors. And that can extend not just in the case of China, but it could even extend to Gulf states with respect to energy as well. I do think we have to, uh, we have to look at a rebalancing to, in some cases, re repatriate or onshore critical production of, of some essentials, PPE, the personal protective equipment, a term that nobody would have heard of six months ago, PPE as an acronym. Now in our country, everyone knows what that means. I'm not sure if it's the same in the UK, but some, some of these things will be need, need to be rebalanced. And here's where, Jonathan, the Trudeau government and its foreign policy of virtue signaling for its for its UN Security Council bid has really missed an opportunity to temper the Trump government's agenda on trade. So I represent a community with an auto industry in, uh, in Ontario, in the Toronto area, that after 100 years, our auto facility for General Motors, where my dad worked growing up, just closed after 100 years in our community largely because of 
trade and tariff problems that Canada's had with the United States. Rather than, you know, virtue signal against the Trump administration and, and not work with them, Canada should have worked very closely with the U.S. on their concerns about Chinese transshipment and dumping of key commodities like steel and aluminum. The, the Obama administration started tariffing China's, Chinese steel because of their, uh, their violation of, of the rules-based order of the WTO and the increasing transshipment of, of steel for refabrication and then import was something that the, the U.S. administration wanted to take on. We should have worked with the Americans on that. Instead, by not working on it, the Americans applied even tariffs against us. And I'll, I'll use this as an example. The aluminum supply in Canada was so key to the war efforts uh, 76, 78 years ago that the Americans built a military base in Canada with us, of course, but to, to protect our aluminum supply in Quebec. So we have always been so integrated on these commodities, yet we drifted apart from our closest ally. And as, as the Americans have tried to rebalance Chinese actions on trade, we weren't there with them. And I think increasingly we have to make sure that the Five Eyes and other partner countries like France, Japan, a, a range that share our interests, share our values, our, our democracy, rule of, rule of law states, have to counterbalance um, um, Chinese actions with respect to, to, to trade. So I think that will be the biggest thing. I almost think we could see in the next few years trade blocks of a form sort. And, and I've said we should look at free trade among free nations. Mm. And, uh, and it should almost be a club. And if you're a bad actor, you're not invited into the club. Mm. And I think that could be a much more engaging multilateralism rather than the Western world turning a blind eye to, to some of the bad actors. I think we have to exclude them. Aaron, you mentioned PPE, and that's been an issue uh, in, in the UK and Europe, just as it clearly has in North America. Like you say, um, global labor arbitrage, the outsourcing of Western manufacturing, um, it costs lives. I mean, it's actually, it's, it, I, it, certainly in the UK, it's actually cost lives. What do you see as some of the potential, um, obviously there are a lot of downsides, you know, overwhelming downsides to the crisis, but could there be some positives? Um, could this be a uh, catalyze uh, manufacturing coming back? Um, could this uh, catalyze other, other positive benefits, do you think? I think it could. I think countries will look much more seriously on their own domestic capacity. And what's interesting, I. I did trade in the private sector and then in the Harper government before I became uh, cabinet minister, I won a by-election and then I was promoted to a trade role. I was parliamentary secretary for international trade. And trade agreements do allow domestic preference for security or military type uh, requirements because it's been critical for you to keep your domestic uh, defense and security capacity for the unknown future. Um, and so that preference is, is standard in international trade. I think that concept of what is defense and security industries could be extended to medical, pharmaceutical, gloves and masks, for goodness sake. You know, I don't think a few years ago if someone suggested that there, uh, it would have been t treated seriously. But the defense and the security needs of the UK or of, of Canada in this pandemic have been impacted by that critical shortage just as it, it as much as it would be from some other key def domestic homeland defense component. So I really do think um, we have to look at existing trade rules and see how we can squeeze some, some of these industries within those provisions that allow general domestic preferencing. But I think increasingly there'll be a realignment. So uh, will Canada make everything ourselves? No, but I think increasingly we need to have domestic capacity mm -hmm. for, for a range of critical items and then a reliance on trustworthy allies for the remainder. It will mean, and I've even said this already in some of my, my town halls that I'm having as a conservative leadership candidate, 
and in, in the policy documents and things I'm putting out, Canadians will have to realize that as we build this capacity, it may mean higher prices for a range of goods. Uh, it may mean a while until we can assure a, a consistent and steady supply of items. Um, I've already started talking about how Canada needs to work on food security closer with the United States and Mexico. Um, you know, that food security issue has been a, a real live issue within this pandemic as well. So uh, I think we will increasingly rely on our friends and allies. And in the post-Brexit era, the UK was already looking at these, <laughs> these things uh, and these issues anyway. I think the urgency is, is even more uh, uh, apparent now. I mean, you mentioned manufacturing, of course, but, you know, for the first time in a long time, we actually now have the technology, you know, 3D printing, certainly in the UK, has started to come into its own. Uh, we have we have robotics in a way that's uh, waiting in the wing, wings, waiting for its moment. We perhaps for the first time in a long time have the opportunity, have the have the technical capability to bring manufacturing back to the Western countries, as it were. Um, now, you mentioned Brexit, which uh, leads on nicely. So um, as a, as a uh, fellow subject of, of Her Majesty the Queen, um, as a Canadian Conservative, you've looked on at the Brexit phenomena. Um, what has been your take, uh, looking from the other side of the Atlantic, on Brexit uh, as a phenomena and what has been your view of the European Union over the last few years as an institution? Great question. And um, um, my late mother immigrated to Canada from, from Sheffield after the war, along with many, uh, many Canadians. And two of my sisters returned to, to live there. One still lives in Kent. Right. And uh, I used to use as an example um, her family in, in, in the case uh, of uh, her and her husband, there were different votes on the on the referendum. And so for me, I always said it's it's up to uh, the citizens of the United Kingdom to to make their uh, make their decision themselves. I had never thought it appropriate. The Brexit debate was still kind of alive when I ran for conservative leader in the past. And I always said uh, it's inappropriate, particularly with me with close, uh, close family ties and even a direct uh, connection with the, the north of England that, that for me to weigh in personally. I am good friends with Daniel Hannan and uh, some conservative minds who I think have articulated very well why the country made the decision they did. Um, so that's my political way of avoiding <laughs> saying too much of my personal opinion, but you could probably uh, glean from that uh, what it is. I have had concerns about the, the bureaucracy of any of these large, uh, large multilateral organization. And when you go from a trade block into a, a currency union and an, into an integrated economic union, and then the bureaucracy wants to create a single military and a whole range of things, I think it, it, it and I used to say this to EU ambassadors here in Canada, who I had great relationship with. I was involved in the CETA, the, the, the uh, European Union uh, economic trade uh, uh, deal that Canada negotiated under Prime Minister Harper. Mm -hmm. And I used to just say, I really worried that when you start a bureaucracy, it is like a weed and it will grow and grow and grow and gather more power and want to uh, usurp the, the jurisdiction and... Uh, you know, the ability for a nation to project its own desires and policies. So I, I think that was the biggest thing, I think, with with the EU, is it just started growing in a way that uh, I think was um, not what was originally intended in terms of closer trade and economic ties as a way to be bring peace and stability to Europe. Um, I look just in the last week, uh, Germany and, and, and France are talking about a, a $500 billion package, uh, much of which will go to the south and be paid for by the north. And I, I, think, I think the EU is going to continue to come, on, come under a lot of strain in the coming years because there aren't 
there isn't unified domestic policy for work and pensions and these sorts of things. So eventually you can't expect the more productive parts to constantly um, over control. Uh, so I, you know, I, I leave it to, to the folks in the EU to, to work on the opportunities and challenges, but I, I am a conservative. I generally like a country to be sovereign. I, I really generally like government to be small, limited and efficient and good at what it does. And bureaucracies tend to uh, erode that. So I think smaller, leaner, more effective government, particularly coming out of COVID-19 is what I'm gonna be uh, advocating for. Yeah, I, I often say the EU is a sort of, it's a union without a demos. I mean, we can look around the world and see uh, many regional groupings, uh, trade alliances, NAFTA, the African Union, the Arab League, but not one of these has taken it upon itself uh, to develop the trappings of a sovereign state, such as a currency, a central bank, albeit a, 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 uh, not a central bank in the traditional sense, a parliament, you spoke about talk of a common military. Um, this is certainly more than trade um, and certainly more than a mere intergovernmental talking shop. Before we get on to, um, I'm, I'm very keen to talk about future relations between the UK and Canada and the, of course the Kanzuk idea. Before we do, you mentioned the economic relationship between the EU and Canada. Do you think that could be a model for the post-Brexit uh, economic relationship between the UK and the EU? I know there's been a lot of talk of that, and I, I've even talked with, uh, spoken with the High Commissioner uh, to Canada a little bit on that uh, some time ago, and I, I do know that we were looked at for that guidance. In fact, in the immediate um, um, Brexit, before the actual date of, of Brexit, and, and before uh, Canada was also looked at in terms of the Irish border issue because we have a, a very efficient, well, normally it's closed now, but <laughs> generally efficient border with the United States, particularly in my province of Ontario, where southern Ontario and Toronto juts right into to Michigan and our auto industry in Windsor, Ontario, and across the, the, the lake, across a bridge in, in uh, Michigan was mm -hmm. just in time delivery, very a border, but as, as porous as it could be for, for trade and citizens. And so I know there was a lot of, of time spent by UK and, and other politicians and bureaucrats looking at the Canadian example. And I think anything we can do to, to facilitate that, because I do think, and I, I think Prime Minister Johnson's been quite clear on this, um, Brexit does not mean um, any lack of fondness and, and friendships and alliance with friends within Europe. It just no. means master of our own destiny. And mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, it doesn't mean a rejection of your friends. And so I think uh, our example uh, might be a good one to follow in terms of the comprehensive economic and trade agreement we had with the EU, um, which was certainly not as advanced as what the UK had within the EU. But in terms of prefer, uh, professional recognition, services trade, you know, when I talk to people, a lot of people still think of trade as commodities like grain and, and maybe auto parts and things like this. But Canada's service economy, whether it's financial services, insurance products, a whole range of things, uh, is over well over half of what we trade anyway. That's information and knowledge economy. So the recognition and, and mutual respect of standards and things like that, I think that will be very easy for the UK because there's already been a bit of harmonization. So I think it, it's eminently doable, and I, I hope both sides look at it as a way to to respect one another, but also try and and partner and, and have mutual benefit. Right now, the UK and the EU in, are in what's called a transition uh, transition sort of a moment. Um, they're in negotiations at the moment. This transition period is due to end at the end of 2020. Lots of people here and in and in the EU have said it's all shoulders to the wheel on the coronavirus crisis, and because of that. Uh, neither the UK nor the EU have had the time and resources to commit um, to developing a fully comprehensive trade deal. And so there are calls on both sides of the channel to push the transition period back. And of course, during this transition period, 
The UK remains in the EU single market and customs union, but does not have representation in Parliament. In a, in a sense, it's a little bit like ta taxation without representation. Um, you, you may be wary of our well, well, quite exactly. We all know how that went. So, what would you say to those people um, broadly who are saying, let's push the transition period back um, between the, uh, the EU and the UK into 2021, into 2022? Um, what would you say to that? Well, first, I'll do the caveat as I did. Uh, these are decisions for, uh, for, for you and your countrymen and, and uh, your EU friends. Uh, but I, I, I think there will always be reasons to, to delay. And I just think uh, get her done, as an expression is used uh, in south of the border here quite a bit. And I'm, I'm much like that is uh, I, I really don't, I never took seriously some of the doom and gloom prognostications. I do think there's trade is something where there's mutual benefit uh, between countries. Um, and as long as you can try and leverage that for both sides in a way that you're not looking at trade in the context of post Brexit as punishing one side or another, it should be what can we do together? Um, I certainly know the COVID-19 crisis has paralyzed everything. But I do think there's probably a template to follow for an orderly uh, transition that the longer you delay it, it's, it's like the Band-Aid uh, scenario we might use with our children. Um, if it, peeling it off in sections could be, could be just as complex or painful. So that would be my own personal view, but um, it, it is certainly not my domain to, to force that view. Now, post-Brexit and post the transition period, what do you see as some of the opportunities uh, for future economic and geopolitical relations between the UK and Canada, and indeed between all of the Commonwealth realms, the Kanzak countries? I think there's tremendous, uh, tremendous potential with a Kanzak type proposal, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, UK, um, but certainly also um, direct bilateral between the UK and those those countries as well, because I think post post Brexit, the UK will have to solidify uh, it, its trading patterns and, and what it needs to do, superimpose on this, the issues with China and, and global trade. I think uh, the UK would be smart to, to do as much bilateral work. But if we could advance some sort of Kanzak proposal, I really do think there it makes so much sense and could easily be facilitated, particularly if the Conservatives in Canada are able to win, we would have pretty much alignment between the UK, Australia and Canada. And New Zealand often uh, will, will work in collaboration with Australia on issues. And they have the original template, the, uh, the Trans-Tasmanian Agreement mm -hmm. um, that allows sort of ease of trade and, and work and things like this between uh, New Zealand and Australia would actually provide a bit of a template. I don't want any bureaucracy to be created or anything else, but I think the ability for investment, trade, security, and the the mobility with some constraints of, of people for, for work terms and opportunities, I think makes a lot of sense. It, it's happened in little small student programs and other things for decades, you know, locking it in as a permanent way of showing special preference to the countries we're most closely aligned with that we're, we're really part of the same family, I think makes imminent sense. I've always said Kanzak also shows uh, what multilateralism could be mm. in terms of aspirational multilateralism, as opposed to some of the games we see at the UN. Um, Closely aligned countries should be doing more together uh, for mutual benefit. You mentioned about um, the bureaucracy side. How would Kanzak differ from the European Union, in your opinion? Well, this would really just be a, a series of uh, mutual agreements. And then, you know, almost like a Commonwealth style leaders meeting or political meeting. Um, our parliament, we have a Canada UK. A parliamentary association 
where parliamentarians will do exchange, you know, will have, I would really just see it as being one one sort of step up from that, where we we make sure it's fluid enough so that if if Canada has a shortage of certain key workers or something like this, how can we uh, work for mutual benefit so we're not robbing one of the others of essential workers? Mm. But how can we facilitate uh, some labor agreements, these sorts of things? I really do think for students, Jonathan, the, the potential here is great. Mm -hmm. uh, I would love to see an opportunity where um, a Canadian could study in the UK for around the same tuition or maybe a slightly uh, slightly higher tuition, but less than what a foreign tuition for someone from other part of the world would be charged. And then for that young man or woman to have the ability to maybe work in the country afterwards um, for a time before coming back. Uh, we like to joke that our famous uh, Whistler ski area in British Columbia is essentially run by Australians who, who come there as one of their sort of gap year type uh, world travels. We, so we already have forms of this happening, but there's really just no uh, domestic preference shown for the allies. And that's, that's what would, this would be, would just be a series of sort of agreements and understandings. Uh, and then, of course, enhanced defense and security and intelligence work, which is already happening through the Five Eyes and through our alliances anyway. But formalizing that, um, really taking it to the next level is what I think Hands Up could be. People listening to us may say, well, what's the problem with the status quo as it is now? Why, why is Hands Up needed for all sides? Well, I think um, particularly for the UK, I think Hands Up represents something that is almost perfectly aligned to what the UK is doing anyway, coming out of uh, out of the EU, um, looking at that new realignment. And many, many people have talked about how the Commonwealth, if you if you expand it wider, needed a, a 2.0. And I think Kanzuk could be that 2.0, meaning other members of the Commonwealth, if they could get their rule of law, their human rights record, uh, their democratic institutions and sort of governance to a level that it's uh, that it's aligned with with the four countries in in the Kansas group, uh, we could we could have more join, and mm. I think that would be uh, remarkable. Then we would have coverage, uh, as I used to learn at Royal Military College. You know, in the old days, the sun never set on the British Empire. Uh, now, in the modern time, that would be trade linkages, the ability to have uh, extra security and intelligence, eyes and ears around the world. Why would we not do this, provided it's with people we trust and we're aligned with? And uh, so I really think there's huge opportunities for the UK. I think particularly Australia is really taking the lead right now in terms of a, a realignment vis-a-vis -vis China. And that's quite bold leadership. I've been very impressed by the Australians because they are in the direct sphere of influence of Beijing. They have a free trade agreement and are much more susceptible to uh, uh, the, the Communist Party's, you know, age old uh, uh, tactic of pressuring and pressuring to get their will. The Kansas group of countries and then, of course, more work with the United States, that group can't be susceptible to the same amount of pressure. And I really think that group, including Kansas, add the U.S. to it. Um, we should be having aligned positions on things like Huawei in our 5G. And I've been uh, happy to see this recent news in the UK to suggest that the core periphery approach to Huawei may be on the wane. Because I really do think the aligned intelligence security partners have to have an aligned approach to these fundamental uh, potential threats. And let's not overstate the threat, but we should certainly not be uh, having critical 5G infrastructure uh, with any potential for a security risk. We should just not permit that to happen. And we should make sure that there's no weak element of the five eyes um, to make sure that that alliance stays strong. Kanzak certainly has scope and strength, and obviously uh, you mentioned it, extending it. And there are 16 countries which share the Queen as head of state. So that's certainly where uh, we could potentially look in the future. Erin, um, people listening to us, um, Talking about Kanzak, 
would also say that uh, the UK has had this um, economic relationship with the EU, this, this 500 million strong block um, right on its doorstep. Um, you obviously have an extreme, extremely strong relationship with uh, the world's uh, superpower. Um, Kanzuk could never, people would say, Kanzuk could never compensate um, for the uh, loss uh, that, the, that the UK will have from Brexit economically. And it, it could even be construed as a sort of slap in the face um, or an elbowing out towards the United States. What would you say to that? I wouldn't agree with that. In fact, um, I'm, I just wrote an op-ed that, that uh, hopefully will appear in the Times uh, in the UK and, and perhaps in a paper here as well, um, reminding people of Winston Churchill's speech um, in Missouri that he gave as opposition leader. It's hard to think that less than two months after VE Day, Winston Churchill lost the election in the UK. Uh, I remind people in Canada who see Justin Trudeau's poll numbers as being high right now, I said, Look, Churchill saved the free world and then lost an election at the polls because of some existing political troubles. Um, but in that speech he gave, he talked about the importance of the, the, the Anglo-Commonwealth-U.S. alliance uh, in terms of providing the counterbalance to, at the time, what was the new creation of the United Nations. But I think any of these um, global multilateral organizations, whether for trade, security, uh, peace and development, a whole range of things, it's only strengthened by the Commonwealth and aligned countries working together to advance the, the, the goals of those, those organizations. So if we're trying to make sure that there are rebalanced and strong trade ties that, that take into effect uh, state-owned enterprises from Beijing, for example, that will help EU member countries. Um, and of course, there's there's the opportunity to do more trade bilaterally, uh, you know, with a, a number of other uh, groups of countries. I, I really do think, you know, even the EU is having this struggle of uh, how to address Chinese trade practices. And some countries are a little more warm to, to Beijing than others. Uh, this is a real issue, and I don't think anyone could say the fact that lifelong allies and friends like like the Kanzuk company countries doing more together is somehow an insult on on other people. As I said, my own family is a great example. My sister is in Kent with her family. Um, my my other sister married an Australian Air Force pilot who was on exchange with the RCAF, um, and uh, and sh they met in Canada. And so there's already such deep, deep ties, uh, the same sovereign, the same history, the fighting and dying together. Um, I've said recently, uh, Canada needs to back the UK with respect to uh, uh, Mr. Patton's um, move on, on the Hong Kong uh, situation, because Canadians died defending Hong Kong. Um, in fact, we have Canadians buried in Saiwan Cemetery, and so we've lost still blood there. We have 300,000 citizens living there. So these these connections predate uh, the EU, and, and so I don't think anyone could seriously say that the best friends doing more together is somehow a slight on other friends. No, and economically, it's not a zero sum game. And of course, um, I would argue the Kansas countries represent possibly the most uh, dynamic and uh, countries in the in the Western world and perhaps with the best growth potential. Now, right now, um, the UK and the US are currently entering trade negotiations on the UK side led by Liz Truss, on the U US side led by Robert Lighthizer. It's getting quite a good bit of press coverage here. We've spoken a bit about the uh, future, the, the, the Kanzak idea. We've spoken about the uh, future trading relationship speak in a little more detail what you see potentially under your leadership what would uh, future economic relations look like with between the UK and Canada in the future compared to how they are right now well certainly if I'm successful in becoming conservative leader and prime minister uh, it will be a major focus uh, of attention 
Um, in fact, I had a delightful conversation with a uh, Tory MP, Alicia Kearns, uh, last week, uh, talking about Kanzuk and a few areas of, of, of shared interest. And we were both remarking uh, about how our caucuses, the Conservative caucuses in both countries, have said our countries need to do more together. It's almost like we're uh, we're in that uh, middle-aged uh, part of the relationship of a long-time marriage, and we we haven't valued each other as much as I think uh, we could. And I think uh, Brexit provides an opportunity for I think the UK to really broaden and deepen its relationship with key partners, and no one no one more so than than Canada, I think, as kind of the lead uh, player of the Commonwealth and and um, particularly going back to the Churchill quote, I like to use a lot, the linchpin. Canada can be that linchpin between the UK and the United States, particularly if there is a, a mercurial leader in Washington, which I think we have one now. So how can we advance issues that are in both of our country's national interests and temper some of the actions of the United States. I really think if Trudeau had not driven a wedge between Canada and the US and the Trump administration, we probably could have taken his trade concerns with China and coordinated it a little better with other allied countries. We could have worked together on Huawei and, and a range of things that are affect, going to affect North American um, infrastructure security and a whole range of things. We have to deepen these partnerships and there will be differences, but close allies can work through differences. And um, today's Memorial Day in the United States and uh, I, I put out a post reminding people about how uh, we have fought and died together. There in Arlington Cemetery, there is a cross erected by Canada because thousands of Americans came up to Canada in World War I to go and fight in Europe. Um, and and di they di Americans died with Canadian units in the Great War, and so we've got we've got such deep ties that we shouldn't ever take take them for granted, and we should never suggest that one president or one prime minister of any country represents the relationship. It is far deeper, far more historic, far more important than than any particular individual leader, we, and we have to really make sure we remember that. Yes, it's people, it's people to people rather than government to government. And that's what makes the Kanzak relationship so special. Now, Erin, tying together everything we've spoken about, um, uh, the coronavirus crisis, um, Brexit, the potential for Kanzak, uh, and of course, the future relationship between the Western world and China. If you had one major prediction or forecast for the medium term, perhaps the next six to nine months, the rest of 2020, what would that predictional forecast be? Uh, my, my forecast would be um, two things. One, I do think the early stages of a global trade realignment will start to take shape. Uh, I do think it will be led by the United States, but if Australia keeps uh, its important contributions going, I think we could see more countries working with the United States. And that's really what it will take. We, we're in a prolonged fight with China diplomatically now. They have two of our citizens detained over 500 days because of an extradition arrest of a Huawei executive that led to uh, you know, a huge diplomatic confrontation between our countries. And alone, we are very vulnerable to pressures but united with our friends, uh, I think we have the ability to have counterbalance and we can't be, be pushed around on a trade level uh, so easily. So that's the first thing. I think we'll see the early signs of it and I really hope it's more than just one country. I think we need, need alignment. The second thing, and it, I don't wanna end on this, so you'll have to ask me some other question too, <laughs> because I really do think we could see prolonged economic depression from this. Um, you know, yeah. I'm really seeing the, the signs of, of unemployment in Canada. We are running a quarter of a trillion dollar one year deficit for our country. It's really unheard of. And UK, US, everyone is passing 
immense, enormous uh, aid packages. But if employment doesn't bounce back, we are going to see very, very challenging times. Mm -hmm. and, and this is why I'm so opposed to the ideological agenda of Justin Trudeau here, who has been trying to stop Canada from producing oil and gas and, and minerals and forestry. Our traditional resource strength is what we're going to need to power us out of this. Mm -hmm. Trudeau has slowly been attacking those sectors in Canada. So I, I am quite worried about the next five uh, to 10 years of the global economy. If we don't see employment return, we could have prolonged economic uh, uh, depression, um, huge, huge risks to public finances. And then of course, a whole range of crime and, 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 and social, social challenges that come as a result of that. So the more we can coordinate to work together, the more we can rebalance and get the, the global economy going together, the, the better, because I'm, I'm worried right now. Well, perhaps an optimistic tone to finish on would be the, the, the idea that this crisis could catalyze a new industrial renaissance. We spoke obviously about that earlier. I'm sure in Canada, certainly here, well, around the world, uh, homeworking uh, has, has become the norm. And we know that homeworking uh, tends to lead to more uh, productivity. Um, perhaps what we may see is, is, and what we perhaps need, is a reset rather than a restart technologically, economically. And that can bring in a new industrial renaissance and perhaps uh, a better standard of living in the long term. I would, I would really like to see that. And I, I do think there is the potential for that. And uh, how, can we, how can we make sure that the realignment does benefit particularly Canada and its closest allies and superimpose onto that Kanzuk and, and countries aligning to help uh, rebalance trade, bring uh, onshoring opportunities with innovation uh, alongside them. Uh, I think that's what we need to see. I've been saying I want to see a V-shaped recovery. So we know we've had a dramatic drop. Let's try and position for a dramatic rise back up of economic activity and performance. And that means employment has to be key, uh, and particularly in Canada, small and medium-sized businesses where about two-thirds of the jobs are in Canada. So yeah, I'm I'm always an optimist. So as much as I'm I'm worried, I do think that Canada has the resiliency, uh, as do many of our allies. And let's look at this, as you said, as kind of a reset and an opportunity for a, a rebalancing and a renaissance that I think could help all of us. Well, that seems like a good, positive, strong note on which to end. So, Erin O'Toole, thank you very much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Jonathan, and best wishes of health and, and success in a renaissance to, to you and all your listeners. Thank you. And thank you for watching. You can find out more at www.brexit-watch.org. You can also find us on Twitter and on Facebook. Until next time.